for our invocation, please welcome Stephanie Simpson, Vice President, Administration, New South Capital Management, and WFGM board member. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Please bow your head to our invocation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for a moment to pause, to eliminate all the noise and distractions in our lives and reflect on your goodness and love despite the circumstances in our broken world. Thank you for the opportunity to assemble freely here today. We know that we have work to do. Help us to remember that we can accomplish more when we seek to unite rather than to divide. For there is power in unity. You remind us in Galatians 6, 9 to not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. We are grateful that we can celebrate progress together. Thank you for this food and for the hands who have prepared it, and for those who have made this day possible, for the ones we will recognize, and for the ones who will go and notice. You know and care for all. Help us to have eyes to see each other as you see us, hands to serve as you taught us to serve, and hearts to love more like you love us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome President of MHM Investments and Chair of the Board of Directors for the Women's Foundation for Greater Memphis, Mary H. McDaniel. I would also 
also like to recognize all of the elected officials with us here today. If you are an elected official, please stand to be recognized. Thank you for all the work you do and your continuing support and service to our community. To our sponsors, our donors, and friends, we are grateful to each one of you. Thank you for bringing your guests and a big welcome to all of you. This morning during our press conference, we announced our 2019-2020 investment commitment. And listen up. The amount of investment for 2019-2020 will be $1.25 million, supporting the goals of our Vision 2020 Strategic Leadership Plan. Now you likely remember that in 2015, at this annual tribute luncheon, we introduced our Vision 2020 plan. And that plan is to simply reduce poverty by 5% over five years in zip code 38126, which is one of this area's highest concentration of poverty in Memphis. Since 2016, we have completed a total commitment to Vision 2020 equaling $4.7 million in, in work and services in the 38126 zip code. I would like to express our appreciation to our dear friends at the Hyde Foundation. Since 2002, they have generously given us a unique opportunity to announce a challenge grant during the luncheon. So today, ladies, it's no different. We want to thank the Hyde Foundation for another challenge grant commitment of $50,000. We are also grateful for the hundreds of donors and volunteers who have stepped up to become a part of embracing and seeing our vision for 38126 and, for, and Memphis be realized. I want to express our sincere gratitude to our Tribute Luncheon presenting sponsor, the FedEx Corporation, FedEx has been our presenting sponsor for nearly 20 years, providing financial and volunteer support. And FedEx, I want you to know that we could not do this without you. We appreciate all of our generous sponsors for your dedicated support, which allows the Women's Foundation to be a leading organization leveraging regional and national resources to create social change in the Memphis community. A list of all of our sponsors can be found in the program book and will be displayed on the screen throughout this program. Again, I want to thank each and every one of you for attending today, and I do hope you enjoy the luncheon. I would like to welcome to the stage officers from one of the most respected, influential companies in Memphis and worldwide. The presenting sponsor of the annual tribute luncheon for the past 19 years, FedEx. Please welcome Women's Foundation Leader, Roundtable Corporate Sponsorship Committee, Chair Bree Career, Executive Vice President, Chief Marketing and Communications Officer, FedEx Corporation.
have seen a couple. So a, a huge shout out to all the gentlemen who have braved uh, this afternoon and joined us. I am delighted to be here with you for the Women's Foundation Annual Tribute Luncheon. This is our company's 19th year, and I'm going to go on record and say it will be 20 next year, because of course we're going to do it again next year. And I am particularly excited about this year's theme, Empowered Women, Empower Women. I know personally how much I have benefited from strong women in my life who emboldened and encouraged me, and some of them in the room this afternoon. And the strong females who make up the Women's Foundation Board have made it their mission to not only empower, but to change the lives for women and their families by breaking the cycle of poverty in Memphis. As a champion for change, the Foundation combines philanthropy, leadership, grant making, research and advocacy to help thousands in Memphis reach their full potential. And we are extremely proud of the progress the organization's Vision 2020 program continues to make towards its goal of reducing poverty by 5% in zip code 38126, one of the poorest areas in the city. In the first three years alone, we have seen a 49% increase in average household income in this zip code. 49%. Absolutely incredible. To reach its overarching mission of reducing poverty in 38126, Vision 2020 focuses on five goals, which Susan Stevenson will cover later in the program. But since we have Terry Carmichael Jackson here with us today, I can't resist sharing quickly how the Women's Foundation is using basketball to inspire young women and bolster the fourth Vision 2020 goal of youth development. And this is personally very meaningful to me to have Terry here today because I have three young daughters, all who play basketball. Um, and one's quite tall, so I'm going to get some tips later. Through the Booker T. Washington Girls Sports Program, young women visit colleges and meet with coaches outside of the Memphis region. They're exposed to new cities and new cultures, helping create an ambition for life outside of inner city Memphis and a path to get there, which is very important. Here's a little about what Booker T. Washington Lady Warriors, don't you love that name? I love Lady Warriors. I think, I'm gonna, I think that's just a fantastic name. So here's a little bit about what the, the basketball team had to say on their recent trip to New Orleans. Angela, a senior, said, It was the first time we actually got to talk to real college students from different parts of the world. Trené, a junior, said, We got a chance to see stuff that we don't get to see here. We got to eat some new, real New Orleans food and to visit Xavier and Tulane University and see their beautiful campuses. Krusha, a high school junior said, the opportunity to take the trip to New Orleans was a blessing. I got to see how college players practice and it made me think, what should I do to get there? These are some simple observations that so many of us in this room take for, would take for granted and these young women are getting these incredible opportunities to be exposed to something bigger and broader than inner city Memphis. These are just a few examples of what the Women's Foundation's impact is and why FedEx is so proud to support their incredible work. At FedEx, our mission is to connect people with possibilities around the world. And the Women's Foundation is one brilliant example of making transformative connections for women and families in Memphis. 2016 Legends Catalyst Award honoree, Beverly Robertson. be heard. I have claimed my title as a survivor, a warrior, an eagle, and Mother Earth. I've been to hell and back, and God accompanied me throughout the journey. I am a woman. This quote is by Renita Weems, and it really epitomizes the essence of the 2019 Legends Award honorees. It is indeed a pleasure and a privilege for me to present them today, and I was so humbled to receive this honor in 2016. And by the way, let me just say this as well, and this is off script, but let me thank each and every one of you who have expressed your appreciation for the fact that Memphis now has the first woman and the first black woman to be the head of the Chamber of Commerce. And I 
will simply say this, you won't be disappointed. <laughs> Empowered women empower women. And that is the theme that anchors our this year's salute to our Legend Award honorees. This award marks 10 years of uplifting the life-changing impact of women's work. The Women's Foundation for Greater Memphis honors four exceptional women who have set a precedent for the future of philanthropy, of leadership, and collaboration. The Legends Award has paid tribute now to 69 powerful women. Our honorees are recognized through original art and prose, created through a collaborative effort between an artist and a writer. First, we want to recognize our past honoree artists or writers that are here today. So if you have written in the past, or if you have done a piece of artwork, please stand and allow us to thank you and recognize you. Stand for us. Thank you very much. The 2019 pieces were unveiled at the Legends Award reception on April 11th and are on display in the lobby this afternoon. The pieces will tour throughout Memphis at various locations for one year before being put on display in the Hall of Legends at Baptist Memorial Hospital for Women. <laughs> so let's now begin the 2019 Legend Award honorees. Our first Catalyst Award honoree is the Reverend Cheryl J. Beard. Reverend Beard for a number of years, for probably the last 20 years, and I can tell you not only is she a transformational leader, but she is an awesome person that drives change wherever she is. Her friend, Loretta Taylor, says that Cheryl taught her a valuable lesson about leadership. There are leaders who lead for people. There are leaders who lead with people. And Cheryl taught us how to lead through people. Reverend Cheryl J. Beard believes in the concept of a village in which everyone should contribute to and focus on developing children. Beard's mission has been to nurture and protect our most valuable assets. Her indomitable spirit is what makes her a legend. Beloved Community, Community Beloved by Brooks Arden is a painting incorporating watercolor and ink with an acrylic glaze finish. The piece is a powerful statement of Reverend Cheryl's focus on community, social justice, and her work to ensure a bright future for youth. Her prose, Indomitable Community Warrior by Latrivia Welch, was inspired by Reverend Cheryl's priority in making sure children are emotionally, physically, and spiritually empowered. In her concept of a village, she believes that everyone should contribute to and focus on the children. Let's greet now Reverend Cheryl Beard. Claudia Halton. Yes. A step ahead. If you don't know a step ahead, you better ask somebody. Claudia is described as being a woman of faith, patience, and dignity. Her friend, Howard Robertson, that's my husband, says, Claudia provided options and resources that young women in our community never had before to get a step ahead. Claudia Halton is a human dynamo, charming, fun-loving, and accomplished. She's a woman who has helped transform thousands of women's lives 
through empathy, determination, and the relentless pursuit of a goal. Grit and grind is most often associated with the local NBA team, our Grizzlies, but not one of those players has more grit and grind than Claudia. Artist Jill Samuels' painting, Charted Path, was inspired by Claudia's love of helping young women form a plan and find their path. The complimentary story, Helping Women Get a Step Ahead by Shirley Clark Barber, captures Claudia's phenomenal persona. It was largely inspired by her ability to recognize a need, being confident that she could help, and taking a holistic approach to transforming women's lives. Let's now salute Claudia Alton, a step ahead. Our Innovation Award honoree is Mary Armour. Mary is a visionary woman. Her colleague Janet Phillips says Mary was innovative in making sure all children have the opportunities to be safe and well. Children, love, family, excellence, passion. Mary Armour's favorite words. To know her is to know that her heart influences everything. She sees the plight of impoverished children in Memphis. If you see what we see, it's really tragic. Poverty is particularly horrible for the children. They have no way out unless someone stoops down to lift them up. And thank God for the Women's Foundation, because that's their work too, lifting others up, especially our children. So I appreciate them more than they will ever know. Soaring by Brenda Wiseman is a painting on a wood panel. It incorporates hand-painted papers and high-flow acrylic paint. The bright red color through the center of the painting signifies Mary's powerhouse personality and her heart. She has added a heart image to show Mary's out-of-the-box thinking, which has created such a legacy for the community. Her Heart is Everything by Faith Morris is inspired by the various intimacies of motherhood. At the end of the day, the question she is most concerned with is, how are the children? Let's recognize Mary Armour. and Leadership Award honoree is Dr. Indiran Iteshwani. Yes. She has been busy for a long time in this community. Dr. Teshwani is a bold and determined advocate. Dr. G. Scott Morris says that Dr. Teshwani has a very powerful philanthropic gift. Her confidence is quiet, her personality warm, and she is unapologetic in her manner. After volunteering as the first female OBGYN surgeon for the Church Health Center, she opened her own practice in 1974 to serve the healthcare needs of women regardless of their income level. Dr. Tejwani has given up her time her talent, and expertise unsparingly, delivering more than 6,000 babies and helping countless women address the health care needs. 6,000 women for babies. Oh, I say she knows what she's doing, don't you think so? Yes. A Wealth of Life by Jess Tinsley is a 30 inch by 40 inch mixed media production. It conveys the way Dr. Tejwani has brought life into the world, cradled in a sari layering with 
Bendy's to show how she has affected other people's lives through her tireless dedication to giving her all and certainly giving her best. You Just Do by Joanna Krangel illustrates Dr. Tejuane's poise and balance. Her mantra, You Just Do It, is about giving until you can't give anymore. Let's pay tribute to Dr. Tejuani uh, and our winner of the year, our legend recipient of the year. Thank you so much for your attention, and let's salute again our wonderful Legend Award recipients for 2019. Let's give them a hand. Foundation Board of Directors, Vision 2020, Development Chair and President and Co-Chair of Independent Bank, Susan Stevenson. Good afternoon. And I just want to say again to the four women we just recognized, what a great honor it is um, to have a chance to know you and to have the benefit of your gifts to our community. Thank you again. It is my great privilege to serve as the chair for Vision 2020 for the Women's Foundation of Greater Memphis. And each year I have the opportunity to stand before you and give you an update on our progress. It's a very inspiring and challenging task to try to encapsulate our work in a handful of words. But what I do have a chance to say to you today is that we continue to be committed to the idea that women and children in 38126 and zip codes all over our community may in fact thrive. In the words of former UN Secretary General and Nobel Peace Prize winner Kofi Annan, when women thrive, all society benefits, and succeeding generations are given a better start in life. It's so true, when you think about what it means to thrive, it means to grow vigorously, to have a chance to gain in wealth or possessions, or to make progress toward a goal, either because of or in spite of the circumstances that you face. Over the past three years, we've made great strides in our five-year Vision 2020 strategic plan to reduce poverty in zip code 38126. When we began this program, this community was underserved and under-resourced, but incredibly deserving. What's important about our journey is this. What began as a commitment to an idea has become a commitment to individuals. Because what we see today is now the face of the individual member of our community, people who have become part of the Women's Foundation family. And we believe together with those people, that we can make 38126 a community where all citizens not only survive, but thrive. The overarching goal of Vision 2020 is to reduce poverty by 5% by the year 2020 in that zip code. And we do that by focusing on five areas. Case management, which is the wraparound service that makes sure that every family has the basic needs that they uh, must have to survive. Job and job skills and job training. Early childhood education and development. Youth development. And financial education and planning. As Mary McDaniel stated earlier, we have already invested more than $4.7 million in 38126, which is also known as the South City. Today I have a chance to give you a report card on the return on investment. And with these metrics, we talk about the numbers that we have made progress on in relation to our goals. But what I think you'll find is far more important, certainly true, that all of these numbers represent individuals and families and their lives, which are far more important than even the numbers can express. We have a partnership with the University of Memphis Center for Research on Educational Policy, and 
and we're very committed to providing really concrete and specific data about the measurable successes that we have. And so today I'm going to share with you some stunning numbers. As you listen to these numbers, I want you to think once again, the numbers are impressive, but far more important are the individuals who stand behind them. So in three years, we have made sure that 1,084 people have jobs and permanent employment. 76 of those people have started their own businesses or micro-enterprises. Micro Seven hundred and six children are now involved in early childhood education and child care programs, which is a beginning path to a better life. Two thousand seven hundred and two young people have been exposed to countless opportunities provided by the programs with our partners supporting positive youth development at a critical tipping point in their lives when they will make a choice about where they go next. 1,250 young women have participated in a Girls' Summit which celebrated the anniversary of Title IX. We've seen a 49% increase in household income. And 10 of our residents have become homeowners. numbers are impressive and they represent a great deal of hard work by all of us in the partnership in this community. But you can't just look at the numbers and you have to think about what still remains ahead. The center, the South City Community Partners have, uh, the South City Community Partnership has started to serve the residents of 38126 and they hold their quarterly meetings in the community center the South City Resource Center, which was established in 2017. More than 2,500 people have gathered in that space for internet, job training, certifications, GED classes, parenting classes, and special events. Over 20 organizations use that space to advance their partnerships. And through our national partnership with the Annie E. Casey Foundation, we've introduced the Evidence to Success Impact Measurement Program. And the South City uh, Community Board that's comprised of local stakeholders has been trained in the science of prevention, evidence-based programs, had diversity training, discussed equality and, and inclusion. And they meet monthly to monitor our progress using the framework for success that Annie E. Casey has implemented in only six cities in the United States of America and we're one. I think we all understand that to improve children's outcomes, we have to focus on a child's entire life because it all works together. And that's why the evidence to success model is so important for all of us, as it brings together public systems neighborhoods, and partners. Together with these strategic partnerships, we will continue our efforts to make 38126 a place where families and individuals thrive. We know that this is complex work. It takes all of us working together. It's not always perfect. It's sometimes quite messy. But the work is important, and the outcomes are amazing. As we work collectively over the next two years, we want to affirm our commitment to move the vision forward. But I also want to take just a moment because it's important for us to see not just the statistics, but to hear the voices of the people who have the real story. And so I invite us all to take a moment to watch a really brief video, video that includes the people who are really at the heart and soul of 38126, the individuals and families whose lives are being changed. They have said it better than we could have ever said it. So what I will ask you now is simply this. This is the work of our heart. It is the work that is changing our city and our community. It was a commitment we made in 2015 
because we believed if we could demonstrate our capacity to change the lives of people in one zip code, that we could do it across our community. Our goal is very simple, and that is to make the lives of women and children and families in our community much better. And today you have a chance to join us in that effort to become warriors with us in this ongoing effort to change our community for the better. We are very grateful to our friends at the Hyde Foundation who have once again agreed to double the gifts that we received today. So if you give us $100, it will become $200. If you give us $10, it will become $20. Whatever you do will make a difference. And think not just of the numbers, which are impressive, but think instead of the stories of the individual lives that are changed for the better. Because by doing something today, you'll make yourself feel good, and you'll be doing good. Thank you. To introduce today's keynote speaker, please welcome President Powers Hill, Design LLC, and Grants and Programs Chair, Women's Foundation for Greater Memphis, Nisha Powers. So he's gonna hide, but he's here. Good morning, Memphis family. There has never been a speaker for our tribute luncheon more sharply aligned with the mission of the Women's Foundation for a Greater Memphis and Vision 2020. Her family recently moved their residency to Memphis by way of a young basketball player. Junior came, so the family came. They could have sat on the sidelines and observed for a year or two. Would have been understandable to New City. Maybe look around, see who's who, get acclimated, see who to affiliate with, but that is not who they are. They give wherever they are with a cheerful heart. Junior wanted to honor his mom's passion and commitment to young women in basketball, so they partnered with Nike and brought talented and beautiful women from across the city, including Booker T. Washington from 38126, and held a clinic, and Junior and his mom poured their hearts into these ladies. That is who they are. You can read about her rise to the position of executive director of the Women's National Basketball Players Association in her bio at your seats, and impressed you will be. Her work demands the ability to negotiate, to be creative, market, listen, solve problems. She certainly walks with all of these talents and characteristics deeply rooted, but I have come to see even more. I want to talk to you about legacy, which is, by definition, a gift bequeathed from one to another. In this story, the legacy was handed down from Miss Eva to her daughter, Terry Carmichael Jackson. It is one of rich upbringing where Miss Eva, present here today, shout out to Miss Eva, And Mr. Leroy, smiling from heaven, nurtured the desires of young Terry's heart. Ballet, gymnastics, piano, tennis, cheerleading. Miss Eva, as Terry's first teacher, developed her fondness for reading, stretched and exposed her to a vast, colorful array of cultures, arts, and sports. But she did not stop there. Like Maya Angelou's grandmother told her, Miss Eva told Terry, sister, when you get, give. When you learn, teach. These are lessons to live by. 
We are all a creation of someone's influence on us that guides and shapes us. And there's something within our raw human wiring that wants desperately to please that influencer, sometimes by emulating them. The legacy of this special family is one of teaching and giving. How fortunate for our community and for the Women's Foundation for a Greater Memphis. My affection for Terry and her family comes from experiencing that spirit ooze out in every interaction with me and my family. So my son Lucas and I thought that experience should be shared with 1,600 people in Memphis. And we asked her to speak at this luncheon. She said yes to Lucas. When I told Lucas that Miss Terry said yes, he said, Mommy, my heart wants to cry because I'm so happy. Women's Foundation for a Greater Memphis guests, please join me in giving a warm welcome first to the family, Miss Eva. Jaron Jackson Sr. And Jaron Jackson Jr. Welcome to Memphis and the Women's Foundation family. And your keynote speaker for the day, Terry Carmichael. Jackson. Good afternoon. Oh wait, they said sellout. So I know we're gonna do better than that, right? Good afternoon. Yes, yes. It is a privilege, it is an honor, it is a tremendous joy to stand before you, to be with you, to share with you at this luncheon today. Thank you, Women's Foundation for Greater Memphis. The Foundation's Board of Directors, their trustees, They've articulated, we heard in Vision 20, they've articulated a vision for the future of Memphis. It is grounded in financial literacy and economic empowerment, and that is important. And the work of Ruby Bright and her team, Ruby, wherever you are, let me salute you. For executing on that vision. The Women's Foundation for a Greater Memphis is an organization that is big and bold. It is big and bold in its commitment to help reducing poverty in a single community. It is big and bold in identifying the resources that are necessary to uplift our communities, in particular, the women and children of our communities. I am humbled having been introduced to this powerful, powerful sisterhood. I am humbled by the breadth and the reach of the foundation, for this is an organization that continues to set the standard for servant leadership. The Women's Foundation for a Greater Memphis is a change agent across our city. The foundation reaches out to emerging and established organizations in a way that gives them a boost, a big hands up, and this work is tremendous. Because of the foundation's efforts, communities can access resources that will enrich the lives of our citizens, particularly the youngest amongst us, that rising next generation of leaders. They sponsor many organizations, and we've seen it, we've been hearing them talked about today, the Streets Ministry, the BTW Lady Warriors, I've heard the shout outs and I've heard them from the back. The girls in, in experiencing engineering at the University of Memphis. 
the Foundation's own Young Women's Initiative, and the Nike Made to Play summer program for the children at the LaRose Elementary School. But it is the work of Shane Young and his team at Memphis Inner City Rugby, and I hope they're here today because I want to spotlight them just for a moment. This is a program that is about more than putting kids on the pitch, putting kids on the field, and teaching them the fundamentals of a new sport, rugby. This is a program that is about the whole person, inside and out, top to bottom, head to toe. Rugby is the vehicle to accountability. Rugby is the vehicle to motivation and academic success, to leadership and athletic success, to what it means to be a part of the team and what that team culture and commitment is. There are teams, there are structure, this is a formal organization when I'm talking about for Memphis and the City Rugby, but at the end of the day, what sustains this group, what sustains this organization, what's at the heart of Memphis Inner City Rugby is the core principle of investing in young people, boys and girls. So that's where I want to frame my remarks that I have for you today. I love our theme, theme of this luncheon, empowered women empower women. Empowered women and girls, what do they do? They empower women. When you bet on women, you do just that. You empower them. And as you will see, you empower the men and the boys in their lives too. Yes, amen, I heard you. <laughs> Memphis, you welcomed my husband, Jaron, our son, Jaron Jr., my mom, Eva, and you welcomed me with the biggest embrace you could give us last summer. This is home. Yes, this is home, and it became home almost immediately to the Jackson 3. And here's a story that I've only begun, just begun to share with those outside of our closest circle of family and friends. Last spring when our son finally determined that he was going to declare for the draft, there was a lot of excitement, a lot of anxiousness too, as he prepared for what would be draft day. And that was gonna soon arrive as it did last June. Life was full. Life was fast and furious. I mean, everything was almost a blur. Things were happening so fast. The uncertainty of when you will be picked, what team will choose you, how you will fit in, how are you going to like it, how you will be received, all of that and more hits you like wave after overwhelming wave. And I'm talking about me. <laughs> as if I was going to be drafted, right? So imagine how the rookie felt. That's what we call him, the rookie. <laughs> then, in a brief moment of stillness, the night before the draft, God did what God is known to do. He sent a reminder. With all that was swirling around us, I remember this clearly, very clear voice in my head reminded me of this. God does not make mistakes. Now I know I've got the amens and I thank you for that applause and I promise I'm not here to preach, but I do wanna share with you because that is how I steadied myself. And that is how I steadied the rookie. My husband, Jaron Sr., he's unflappable. He, he, he was fine. But the night before the draft, I held the rookie's hands in my hands, and I looked him dead in his eyes, 
and I said those words, God does not make mistakes. And then when we heard the words on draft night, the night, and with the fourth pick of the, of the draft, the Memphis Grizzlies select, fill in the blank. When I heard those words, I exhaled and I just beamed with pride because I knew where we, we, the 18 year old and his parents, where we would make home. Remember these words, no, you should envy me. Said very plainly, no arrogance, no bravado. No, you should envy me. I'm gonna explain those words later. Stay with me, okay? You're gonna understand, I promise. I'm not a professional athlete, but I get to represent them. I'm the executive director of the Women's National Basketball Players Association, the WNBPA. I am the staff lead for the first ever sports union for women athletes. And there's that theme again, servant leadership. As with the Women's Foundation for a Greater Memphis, I work in the interests of the players, of the current members, actually the future members, the future WNBA players. When you lead, serve, you look to strike the proper balance to ensure that the members are heard, fully heard, and to ensure that the members, the players, are uplifted in your work, in your efforts. Lead, serve, you must actually serve first, and then you can lead. And in this role, I am clear on this point. I report to the players of the executive committee, the players of the board of representatives, and 140 plus strong, phenomenal voices. They are some of the most intelligent and dynamic athletes who happen to be women on the planet. Tamika Ketchings, four-time Olympic gold medalist and WNBA champion, Swin Cash, two-time Olympic gold medalist and three-time WNBA champion. These are now retired players, but they were part of the executive committee that hired me. Now the WNBPA is led by Neka Abumake, Leja Clarendon, Elizabeth Williams, Carolyn Sword, Sue Bird, Elena Deladon, Chene Agumake. I know you know these names. I know you've heard of them. They are my bosses. They are my bosses, and my job is so cool. And I know we have some UT in the house, right? Some fans of the Lady Balls program built by Pat Summit and some of the legendary elite athletes like Nikki McCray, Shamika Holesclaw, Candace Parker, Tamika Ketchings again, Carol Lawson. Yep, those are just a few of the legendary names out of that program. And if there's anybody from Middle Tennessee, I'm gonna go, out, go ahead and represent Alicia Clark, give her a shout out. When Nisha Powers, and young master Lucas Powers extended the most, most beautiful invitation to join you today. I knew at once that I had to accept. It would give me a chance to tell their story and hopefully along the way connect with you, inspire and enlift us all. In my journey to this current position, there are a few moments that have just stuck out, life-changing moments that have just stuck out and undoubtedly have prepared me to be the advocate that I am, but not just any advocate, the doggone best advocate I could be of girl power. So I'm gonna take you through a few of those moments, like the first time my dad stood up at a school board meeting and gave an impassioned speech 
on behalf of the teachers union. He demanded that the board give them a raise and to begin to treat them like professionals. My dad was an attorney. My mom was a teacher active in the PTA before she joined the corporate world. My parents valued education and they valued teaching as a profession. I wasn't at the school board meeting that night, but by all accounts, my dad rocked the joint. <laughs> the local paper wrote about it and had a picture next to him in the story that ran. My teachers the next day, they didn't want to give me too much attention, I knew. But they gave me a little smile, a little nod. Um, they got that raise. May not have been the raise, but they got a raise. And the investment in them was an investment in me and the other children. And, and that's just my shout out to all the teachers and to the educators in the room today. Thank you. So fast forward to my high school years. I played tennis, but when most people think of me as in, in my high school, they think of me as a cheerleader. I had been a cheerleader from second grade all the way up to, to high school. I had started with the youth Pop Warner programs and football. So the, by the time I got to be a high school senior, I knew, at least in my mind, I was going to be captain. <laughs> with all the flips and the tumbling that we did, we carried ourselves like we were athletes. We entered into all the local competitions to either ensure that we were athletes or to prove that we were athletes. But when it came time for, you know, for folks to kind of show up for us, we showed up for football, we showed up for basketball, but when it came time for folks to show up for us, they didn't. And I remember one administrator kind of justifying why nobody came to our competitions, and he said, well, it's not like you're a real sport, you're just an activity. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. You can imagine my reaction. Cool and calm on the outside, but I was furious on the inside. And so were my fellow cheerleaders, the other members of the squad. So my co-captain and I, we rallied the troops. We talked about what you know next steps would be. We said we were going to make a statement, and we did. Next game was a big game, and we put on our sweaters, our varsity sweaters. But instead of our skirts, we had on our jeans with our saddle shoes. I'm probably dating myself right now. We sat in the section for the home cheerleaders, but we didn't cheer. So, that one time, we didn't get up. We all agreed we were going to come dress the same, we were going to sit together, but not one cheer came from our mouths. And that was kind of hard, too. It was kind of hard. It was kind of hard, because we really did want to show our support. I don't know if we called it a strike or a boycott. We weren't really well versed in labor law, but <laughs> but, but we stood tall and we, we stood together. Even when an administrator came over and tried to yell at us and say, get out there. Nope, we didn't, we didn't. Well, we lost the game. The cheerleaders gained a whole lot of respect from the students and from the parents as we explained what we were doing. The assistant principal called me in the next day. I explained the cheerleader's position. He disagreed, but we didn't get detention, so that was good. We agreed to disagree. That was okay. We had a few football players and basketball players in attendance at our next competition. True story. And I mentioned tennis, right? And I mentioned cheerleader, but cheerleading. Believe it or not, I never seriously played basketball, not one day in my life. I think I practiced briefly with the middle school team. Um, I also had an intramural game. My college roommate begged me to come out or her team was going to forfeit, so I did. Um, she never asked me to play after that, so that just tells you how that went. My college years are probably no different from what you all have experienced. These are years in which you are defined and redefined. 
the philosophy of being in service to others was nurtured in me at Georgetown University as an undergrad and as a law student. Afterwards, I clerked for judges. I got to understand the true meaning of knowing both sides of the argument. When I was practicing, I had the opportunity to study and learn Title IX. That led to me teaching a course that I created called Women in Sport. The course explored the inequitable treatment of women and girls as athletes, women as coaches across sport, and it also followed the growth of women's basketball, women's tennis, women's soccer at the professional level. At the risk of showing my age, this was the 1990s. Women's soccer had exploded on the scene with a big World Cup win, and women's basketball had made its mark too, with dominant wins and shiny gold medals in the Olympics. I wore swoops, and the Nike people in the house know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> swoops was Nike's first signature shoe for a woman athlete, Cheryl Swoops. My class was relevant, it was empowering, it was fun, and professionally, my career would begin to take root in higher education, in law, and in sports, with an opportunity to serve as counsel for athletics for the University of the District of Columbia. And then I took a director position at the NCAA. Without getting into the details of those experiences, and without giving anyone the benefit of knowing that they got under my skin, let's just say I was battle-tested from those days. My personal life provided additional education for what it would mean to go from student athlete to pro. At Georgetown, I met and fell in love with a men's basketball student athlete. We graduated Georgetown together, and ever since, we've supported each other's pursuits in our dream jobs, mine in law, his in professional basketball. We married, and a few years later, we were making plans to start a family. That's when the labor negotiations between the NBA and its union that represents NBA players, that's when they began to break down a little bit. My husband, he read, and he learned that union contract like nobody's business. He became actively involved in the conference calls. He went to the meetings up in New York. He brought the undrafted, hardworking, journeyman's perspective to the table. He was there to represent. It was 1998, and having not reached an agreement in time, there was a lockout. Deadlines came and went. Let me tell you, my husband, I already said he's unflappable, right? He wasn't worried. He was playing for the San Antonio Spurs at the time. Don't hold it against him. I think the Grizzlies were still in Vancouver. <laughs> but those, those San Antonio Spurs, they, they stayed together, they kept in touch, and they were going to be ready for that 98-99 season. Whenever it started, they were game ready. I was teaching my class, Women in Sport, in New Orleans at Tulane University, where we were living. Um, we weren't, uh, we were living within our means and we weren't too worried financially. But then we got the news that I was pregnant and we would soon be the Jackson Three. So a bit of urgency set in, just a bit. Um, so imagine how relieved I felt when the lockout was over and we could share our news that we were having a lockout baby. <laughs> So fast forward again, that lockout baby was drafted by you all, by the Memphis Grizzlies last year. He's completed a stellar rookie season, and so now a professional athlete in dad's footsteps. Education remains a core value in our household, always will be. So he will finish at Michigan State University. and maybe go to law school and follow mom's footsteps. Fast forward again, the email that I received about this job, the description of this position, 
with the WNBPA brought everything, my professional life, my personal life, brought it all into focus. It was and is the perfect opportunity to lead, serve athletes, to understand their journey, to understand it so well that advocating for them is my purpose and my passion. As you may have heard, we are negotiating our own new union contract, our own collective bargaining agreement, and my life is coming full circle. The players, my bosses, they know that it's not only about them, but also about future generations of girls and women who want to play the game at the highest level and demand respect while doing so. The stakes are high and the questions are swirling and once again I find myself swimming upstream, wave after wave of uncertainty, but I'm determined nonetheless. Will the league see this as an opportunity to invest in and demonstrate the value of athletes, of women? These are global gladiators for the sport and they will make big decisions that will impact their livelihood, their health, their wellness, their safety, their well-being, not just as athletes, but as working women, and some of them working moms. These negotiations, I'm, I'm clear, they, they may not rise to the level of our 24-hour news cycle, the, the call for investigations here or hearings there, they may not rise to that level, but they are important. They are important because of the basic issues of equity, value, and fairness. These negotiations are going to impact sport and impact women generally by adding to the larger social and political conversation that we are having today, right now, in this country. It will be a marker in the legacy of women's basketball history and a marker in the overall movement that is about women right now. I pray, and I have lost sleep, just wondering whether I have properly earned the trust of today's players. A colleague of mine, who understands all too well the magnitude of these negotiations. A few months ago, he shared these words to show the level of his understanding and the level of his support. I get it, this is what he said. I get it, I get it. I don't envy you. But before I could let him go on, I said, no, envy me because these players, these women are awesome. They are dynamite. They get it, they understand, and I am right there with them. So I told you I was coming back. The rallying cry of our union, of the WNBPA, is a universal rallying cry that I wanna share with all of you in this room, and you take and share it beyond. It is bet on women. Bet on women. Bet on girls, bet on women, support them, celebrate them, invest in them, empower them. <laughs> By investing in girls and women, we are investing in and strengthening families. We are investing in and strengthening our communities. We are investing in, we are strengthening Memphis, Grind City. And yes, Memphis is home. I may work in New York during the week, but most Fridays, not every Friday, but I try, most Fridays, I am running to the airport 
and then I am running through the airport to get that last flight home. When I land, everything is different. It's a whole different pace. It's a whole different rhythm. I can seriously exhale. It's warmer here. <laughs> the air is balmy and warm, but the people, you, are generous and warm. And this is why we call Memphis home. And it's the generosity that we're going to talk about and can continue to talk about. I thank you for allowing me to share my story. I want to go back to the, the Women's Foundation because I am just so impressed with their work. I have had the opportunity to visit with a few agencies. I came in early, came back to the, to, to, I came back home early this week. Um, and got a chance to visit with some of the agencies that, that they support. And I've seen evidence of the, the impact that they are making across this city on young girls and their families. As you can see, these young ladies are truly in it to win it. Um, and that they are here today. We've heard their voices, but I want them to join me up here on stage. Everyone, please join me in recognizing BTW Lady Warriors, come on up! Woo! for this amazing $50,000 challenge that they have going on. Yes. And as my family looks to join us on stage, come on up, guys. Come on up. I want to encourage each of you. You've got little envelopes in the in the uh, program. Yes, you're holding them up. I love this. I love this group. All right. I want to encourage all of us. We've got to sell out. So let's go ahead and everybody participate at whatever level. Let's go ahead and meet and exceed the challenge that the Hyde Family Foundation has given us. Guys, you may want to come up and join me because we're we're contributing big too. They don't, they don't even know. I'm, I'm, known, I'm known for surprises, so. All, yeah, he said all the time, all the time. The Jackson family, we are all in. We are all in, everybody. We're going to make our own impactful uh, gift of $20,000 today. up front or there are going to be volunteers who are working the room. The rookie said he wanted to say a few words so I'm going to turn the mic over to him and then we are going to welcome the executive director who makes all of this possible, Ruby Bright. All right, rookie, what you got? Don't worry, completely informal. Uh, I wasn't even intending on you know, speaking at all. I just had to say, uh, a long time ago, we used to live in, uh, in Maryland, and we had a big house, real, real big, crazy, spoiled. But uh, 
whenever I get into it with you know, one of them, I yelling, I want this, I want that, you know, the crying, all that, y'all know. So I would always argue with him, and I would look to find her wherever she's at, and she would hide. <laughs> she would hide. She would hide in the, uh, the workout room that's downstairs. She would always be in this corner on the phone, you know, or just not doing anything, trying to just not deal with me, which I get. So I think I think a couple times, you know, she she's there so much, I'm whining. She kind of made it her own little area, like the workout room, you know. So I seen her, you know, recording one time. She never saw me. She was recording videos of just for something like this. She was recording videos, she's going over portfolios, she's got this these binders stacked up. I'm like, yo, what is all this work? This ain't this ain't UDC or the NCAA, any of that, like any of her, like I'm like, well, this is not, and it was all for something like this, like she's been working at this for, since I was like, I don't know, but it's crazy to see her here doing something like this. We don't, we don't, we don't really get that emotion as a family, so it's a little weird. Uh, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy and yes, great event, empowered women. I don't even know how to follow that, so I'm going to turn this over to Ruby Bright, who leads this organization with great zeal and with great passion. Again, thank you, Memphis. Let's do it. Let's be in it. 